Every single video I have created for this channel thus far can be understood in terms of an effort to move beyond a mechanistic mode of orienting the human mind towards reality, and to sketch out what post-mechanistic forms of philosophy, science, and spirituality might look like. Every step of the way, I have attempted to demonstrate how and why the prevailing paradigm of mechanistic materialism frames the world in an extremely myopic and inadequate manner. If you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail, so it is said, and this is precisely the situation we find ourselves in as an increasingly mechanistic civilization of technological dominance. The villain in this narrative is not technology per se, but rather what Martin Heidegger called inframing. The way in which modern technological thinking has created a mode of collective awareness in which all things come to be seen as mere aggregations of dead matter, to be extracted, wielded, and manipulated in an endless and ever-accelerating quest for increasingly precise control over the natural world. All things, from stars and galaxies to atoms and living beings, come to be seen as essentially mechanical systems. It has become common practice both within academic culture as well as popular culture to think of biological bodies as being extremely complex machines made of tiny, squishy machines. The brain is regarded as a kind of computer hardware device and the human mind as a kind of software. In other words, as a complex system of fundamentally mechanical processes. I am far from the first to point out that this mode of apprehension is completely incapable of accounting for the most basic element of our reality, consciousness itself. Without consciousness, there is no world, only darkness. Even though we might sometimes think that we can imagine a world without consciousness, the reality is that even a hypothetical world of pure lifelessness can only be imagined by a conscious being. Without consciousness, there is no criteria by which an actual world could ever be distinguished from a merely possible world. Consciousness is a precondition for the very possibility of understanding a world in that consciousness is the most basic precondition for the presencing of a world within a horizon of experience, thought, meaning, valuation, and concern. Yet, even beyond this fundamental inadequacy of mechanistic metaphysics, we have also seen that the mechanistic paradigm has proven to be inadequate in a myriad of other ways as well. We have seen how, within the scientific fields of biology, biochemistry, and even astrophysics, the mechanistic metaphor has repeatedly reached the end of its rope and has proven itself unable to actually contend with the reality of the world which we have attempted to understand. In previous videos, we have examined these inadequacies in detail, and we have also examined the ways in which figures such as Johann von Goethe, Henri Bergson, and Alfred North Whitehead developed metaphysical and scientific schemes which were intended to allow human thought to transcend the bars of the mechanistic cage which has been constructed around us. In this video, we are going to be briefly summarizing some key points which we have developed in more detail previously, and then moving forward so as to use these ideas in sketching out a more comprehensive and in some ways much more speculative understanding of the human situation within the context of a living and ultimately purposive reality. In what follows, I will be condensing some rather elaborate ideas into a very compact package, and if what I am about to say starts to sound like gobbledygook, then you might want to try looking at some of my previous videos and also consider looking at some of the source materials from which these ideas are derived. 
Many of these notions might seem outlandish or alien to modern intellectual sensibilities, but it is worth noting that virtually all of these ideas are elaborations on ways of understanding the world which can be traced through the whole of Western philosophy and into the much deeper history of the mythical and even shamanic metaphysical languages which lie at the roots of human thought itself. It is the paradigm of mechanistic science which is the exception, a brief and rapidly decaying divergence from a narrative which connects us with a lineage of human understanding which encompasses many tens if not hundreds of thousands of years. To begin with, we can briefly enumerate some of the most fundamental conclusions which we have come to thus far. The most basic of these being that reality itself is fundamentally and necessarily animate rather than inanimate. The most basic building blocks of our world are not inert, lifeless BBs bouncing around in the void in accordance with strict mechanical determination but rather our world necessarily consists of self-organizing, symbiotic, and experiential processes through which forms, patterns of possibility, come together so as to give shape to concretely defined moments of the past. As Alfred North Whitehead tells us, quote, Biology is the study of larger organisms, while physics is the study of smaller organisms. We now live in a world in which we have come to be utterly engulfed by artificial devices, tools, machines, and systems, to such an extent that it is very easy for us to become enchanted by the idea that reality itself is fundamentally inanimate that the world consists primarily of such artifacts, and that living systems are simply complex organizations of such artifacts. We might thus conclude that the human body and mind, for example, are hyper-complex machines made out of tiny mechanical systems in the same way that a calculator or computer or combustion engine is a complex artifact. Yet, if we come to understand that the world consists primarily of living rather than inert processes, then these artifacts come to appear very differently. A hammer, for example, might not seem very alive per se. The hammer does not appear to be driven by any sort of agency beyond that which is imparted to it by the human being who uses it. The hammer does not regenerate itself when it breaks, nor do hammers naturally produce or reproduce themselves outside of human artifice. Nonetheless, at a smaller scale, we can see that the hammer is composed of a myriad of microscopic organisms. Self-organizing, self-perpetuating, and symbiotic systems which are constantly renewing their own form. The hammer itself may not be an organic system, strictly speaking, but the hammer is nevertheless a complex aggregation of living systems which have been combined together in an artificial manner for human technological purposes. In other words, it is artifacts which are the exception, not the rule, and artificial systems necessarily are composed of organic systems. Artifacts such as hammers, calculators, and laptops are only possible precisely because they essentially float on top of an organismic substrate. There is much, much more to be said about the ontological makeup of organic processes than we will be elaborating in this video, but for now, what is most significant is the distinction we must make between potentialities and actualities. As both Whitehead and Bergson show us, organisms are necessarily situated within lineages of inheritance, through which past events come to feed into novel events, which are coming to coalesce through the process which Whitehead refers to as concrescence. 
organisms, in other words, are constantly attempting to reiterate their own past states. There is always a kind of striving towards the maintenance of a sort of dynamic equilibrium, which allows for the self-perpetuation of the organic whole. As we have seen previously, this tendency can be understood as a sort of ontological inertia, a drive towards repetition and the maintaining of ontological demarcations between such organic systems. This ontological inertia is the most central feature of what we commonly understand as being physicality, or what we might more accurately refer to as corporeality that is, the mode of becoming within which past actualities are inherited and thereby incorporated into the bodily composition of novel, self-generative events. Once these self-generative organic events come to fully collapse or solidify into fully defined actualities, they then become integrated into the overall architecture of the past itself, which we can understand as being a kind of foundation or edifice upon which novel events can then unfold through building upon that which has already been determined and established. Countervailing this mode of corporeality or ontological inertia, we then have the mental or cognitive domain, the domain of form or potentialities, the transcendental objects, as it were, which give definition to developing moments of actuality. Just as each occasion of becoming is characterized by a corporeal pull through which the past comes to be inherited or incorporated, so too is each occasion composed of a mental pull, which consists in the space of possibilities which are available to that developing moment of organic process. This mental dimension of an organism can be understood as a kind of phase space, to borrow a term from dynamic systems theory. A complex web or distribution of possible forms, which are experientially felt by the organic system as it navigates itself through time. This is a feature of our reality which can be easily observed through simply attending to one's own experiences. At any given moment, we are encountering a vast array of possibilities, gestures which our hands might make, expressions which might appear on our faces, words which we might say, decisions which may or may not come to be actualized as we navigate such possibilities. Certain possibilities are selected in favor of others, and thus the distributed space of possibilities comes to be filtered down ingressing or involuting into the concrete determination of an actualized event. For the entities which make up our cosmos, every moment is a creative decision which is constrained by its incorporation of the past, yet liberated by the multidimensional indeterminacy of form and potentiality. As our reality is necessarily self-generative in nature, this polar complementarity of corporeal inheritance and cognitive ingression is something which we can see at all scales of the world, like the fractal, self-similar reiteration of a central motif. At the smallest scales, for example, we can see this polarity expressed within the nature of atoms the entities which Whitehead regarded as among the most basic electromagnetic creatures which co-participate in the unfolding of our cosmic epoch. Atoms are not composed of tiny BBs. These organisms lack any of the features which we would commonly associate with physicality in the colloquial sense. Features such as bodily surfaces extended in a definite manner through a particular region of space. 
Rather, these beings consist primarily of fields, distributions of possible events. When we interact with these fields, distributed auras of potentiality, such as that of an atom's electronic shell, give rise to definite events, such as electromagnetic absorptions or emissions. These events cannot be completely predicted in advance as the methods of techno-scientific prediction and control are only able to account for the corporeal inheritance of the past, the manner by which prior, already completed events restrain the form of subsequent events. Modern science is almost entirely limited to the study of ontological inertia, and thus can only regard the mental pulls of living systems through notions such as randomness, gesturing towards the mostly useless metaphor of the unpredictable dice roll. Yet through the lens of an organismic rather than mechanistic metaphysics, we can see that such indeterminacy is in fact self-determinacy. Each organic event is a creative moment in which a complex structure of feeling comes to define itself through the incorporation of prior events and the selection of formative potentialities. We can now begin to expand and refine this scheme through the cosmological models developed by the physicist and engineer Arthur M. Young in his 1976 work, The Reflexive Universe. In this work, Young develops a sevenfold model of cosmogonic processes, divided into an initial descent or catabasis of form into materiality, followed by a subsequent ascent or anabasis, through which life forms come to recreate the universal properties of cosmic consciousness within particular organisms. As we saw in our previous video on the topic, this initial descent serves the purpose of achieving the stability, regularity, and solidity which we associate with the word matter, material, or substance. Relations of pure potentiality become systems of action which we see in the realm of subatomic events. These actions then come to be wound up together into the self-perpetuating knots which we refer to as atoms. Finally, atoms undergo a symbiosis through which the molecular realm then comes into being. Within each phase of movement within this catabolic descent, the freedom of consciousness comes to be restrained. To be bound up within ever more complex processes which are ever more determined by the ontological inertia of the past, and within which ontological distribution or non-locality is sacrificed so as to allow for the discrete, differentiated identities of unique particular beings. As we can see within the affinity between words such as substance and substrate, the materiality which is achieved through this descent serves the role of a foundation, a stable medium through which more complex forms can then come to be realized. The molecular realm serves as the point of greatest restraint and is therefore the most highly determinate realm within this model. Although molecular systems are very much organismic, their creative freedom is much more constricted than the other realms. The behavior of a molecular structure is never completely deterministic, but it is deterministic enough to facilitate the stability required for the realization of the subsequent cosmogonic phases. If we think of conscious agency as a kind of light which reveals available potentialities, then the molecular realm is the point of greatest darkness, in which the widely distributed cone of mental awareness comes to be tapered down into a much narrower keyhole. 
The molecular realm is the realm of the element Earth, that which is most solid and that which is most associated with the foundational nature of the past. Dead bodies, such as leaves in autumn, fall down to the earth and are subsequently subsumed and reincorporated into the earth. The stone and soil of the earth correspond to the notion of the underworld, the realm within which the dead reside and which the world of the living is constructed upon. This is the somatic domain, and within the human body we can see this domain represented most directly by the human skeleton, bones which embody the principle of earth, solidity, and foundation. Moving past this point of greatest constriction and separation, we then begin to move upward as molecular systems come to eventually give rise to cellular organisms plants, fungi, and other such autotrophic creatures. As Arthur Young observed, here we seem to see many striking parallels between the realm of flora, broadly speaking, and the atomic realm, which is directly adjacent to it. Both atoms and floral organisms display radial symmetry, and both operate via principles of absorption and emission. Within the world of flora and with the world of the atom, the most salient feature is that of physiology, the biotic life body or etheric body, or what we might regard as the bioelectric or morphogenetic fields which condition the development of bodily systems. The realm of the life body is the realm of water, blood, and viscera. Substances which flow in accordance with the unconscious and transpersonal rhythms of nature. The imbibing of water connects us with the life body of the biosphere as a whole, while the flow of blood connects us with relations of kinship and ancestry. This watery liquidity is also what connects us with the realm of flora. Just as blood flows through human veins, vascular plants also exhibit complex circulatory systems through which liquids are pumped through the organism's physiological body. As we continue this anabolic ascent, we then enter the realm of animal life. Organisms which are characterized not only by physiology, but also by behavior, movement, and active agency. Again, we see here a direct parallel between the animal realm and that of the subatomic realm, which is directly adjacent to it. Subatomic entities are themselves fundamentally actions, moments of generative symbiotic or destructive interaction which are directed outward by states of disequilibrium, dissonance, or unrest. The animal organism is now constituted by a second sort of field, an ethological field, or astral body. A distribution of possible behaviors, or possible behavior patterns, which are able to mobilize or animate the physiological field or life body. This ethological realm of behavioral patterns is the realm of air pneuma or prana, the breath of life through which animating spirit comes to inhabit and give shape to biological morphology. It is the realm of emotions, drives, and impulses which push and pull animal life in accordance with dynamics of biological equilibrium or disequilibrium. The last stage within Jung's model is that of thought the world of language, and of the direct apprehension of form as such. Here we have entered the realm of the human, and here again we see a parallel between the psychical nature of this mental body and the properties of the realm of light which mirrors it. Light illuminates, it captures the formal properties of objects in the world, and then makes available that formative composition for novel moments of becoming. 
if you are an organism with eyes, in other words. Light allows you to incorporate the form of a distant object into a moment of decision without the need for direct contact with the bodily constitution of the object itself. Likewise, human thought allows a human being to bring its consciousness into contact with the forms which constitute the world without the need for direct contact with specific instances of that form. I can use my imagination to bring myself into direct contact with the form of the equilateral triangle, for example, without the need to bring an equilateral triangle shaped object into my field of awareness. This realm of thought, or of the psychical body, is the realm of fire. As we see in the myth of Prometheus, fire is the property of the transcendental realm, the realm of the gods, which is bestowed upon humanity so as to allow human beings to achieve mastery over the natural world. Mastery of fire allowed our distant ancestors to survive in much colder climates and to derive more nutrition from foods. Fire can also purify water. In the same way that my cognizing of the form of the equilateral triangle strips away the superfluous properties of particular triangle-shaped objects, fire removes the contingencies of the natural world from water as it is boiled and recollected. The realm of the psychical body is where Arthur Young's story ends within the reflexive universe. But if we continue to expand the scope of these patterns, we can see that Jung's model encompasses only the most rudimentary features of a much vaster narrative. We can begin by looking again to Whitehead's process metaphysics, and particularly to the distinction between the corporeal and the mental. Using this diagram as a starting point, we can then begin to elaborate the scheme further by merging it with the distinct layers of reality which were elaborated in Jung's reflexive universe. Each ontological strata of our reality, and therefore each layer of organic composition, is mirrored across a corporeal or bodily dimension as well as a luminous or mental dimension. As we saw previously, the corporeal bodies consist of past actualities and their ontological inertia. The bodily realm consists of that which has already come to coalesce or concress so as to create a lineage of definite, determinate actualities. Mirroring these corporeal strata, we then have the luminous, or mental strata, which consist of feelings of possible forms. Each aura, as it were, is an experience of a definite distribution of possibilities which are available to a given organism, or a given occasion of self-generative processes. The corporeal world is that which we experience with our sensory organs. The luminous realm is that which we encounter through the psyche. It is the world of the formative architectures which continually generate the corporeal realm. If we follow Arthur Young's sevenfold model of cosmogonic process in parallel with this dipolar, Whiteheadian model, what we begin to see is the self-generation of a reality which comes to consist of nine distinct layers. Beginning with the central locus of pure cosmic awareness, the various nested layers of our reality first come to unfold outward, first with the psychical realm, then with the ethological or behavioral realm, then with the physiological or biotic realm, then finally with the somatic or material realm. Upon the completion of this unfolding, the process then begins to act in reverse, moving inward from the outermost shell of somatic physicality. The properties which we see at the cosmic scale come to reiterate themselves by 
enfolding themselves within the domain of biological life forms. Life in general can thus be understood as a fractal, isomorphic intensification of the formative compositional elements which give shape to reality as a whole. The properties of the universal and omnipresent come to be reflected within the particular, imminent, and immediate. This process comes to a monumental axis with the emergence of human thought, but this axial metamorphosis is itself the starting point for another process, one of equally cosmic significance. With the emergence of human thought, we find ourselves on the precipice of the divide between two distinct structures of consciousness. In order to contextualize this transformation, we must now look to the work of the Swiss philosopher and linguist Jean Gebser. If you are familiar with my channel, then you are probably at least somewhat familiar with Gebser's study of the evolution of human consciousness articulated within his magnum opus, The Ever-Present Origin. Within the ever-present origin, Gebser analyzes the history of humanity in terms of the gradual emergence of five unique structures of consciousness. The archaic, the magical, the mythical, the mental, and the integral. Each of these distinct structures have been generated throughout the course of human history, and each structure represents the emergence of a novel modality or dimensionality within human awareness. With the culmination of Arthur Young's cosmogonic phases, we see the birth of human consciousness as such, and therefore the transition between what Gebser referred to as the archaic structure and the magical structure of consciousness. Gebser tells us that the archaic structure is one in which there is not yet any sense of separation or differentiation between conscious awareness and nature itself. The archaic structure is a kind of primordial, embryonic consciousness within which there is no experience of boundary between an internal sense of self-consciousness and an external sense of a world which lies beyond that internal sense of selfhood. This is not quite the same as a sense of self-awareness and the more rudimentary sense of self-recognition. Many creatures such as higher primates and dolphins are capable of recognizing their reflection in a mirror, for example. What is significant here, however, is that within archaic consciousness, there is no sense of one's consciousness being separated from the world by a boundary of thought. There is not yet a demarcation between one's conscious awareness of the world and the world itself. Yet this sense of undifferentiated identity with the world would eventually come to rupture as human awareness came to develop the capacity for language and the correlative capacity for the direct apprehension of form as such. Human thought allows us to cognize the form of the arrowhead independently of any particular instances of that form. We do not need to look at an actual arrowhead in order to bring the arrowhead form to bear within our mental body. Much as light is able to abstract the form of objects and render them available to consciousness, human consciousness is able to abstract the forms which give shape to the world and thus is able to begin using this power to reshape the world around us through the intentional implementation of such forms. It is this development which then allows for the emergence of a sense of human selfhood as something which is felt to be distinct from nature. Human consciousness comes to experience its own thought world as something which creates a sort of metaphysical boundary between the dreamlike, magical awareness of the human tribe and the sleep-like consciousness of the great uterine mother goddess from which humanity emerged. A sense of undifferentiated self-world identity ascends so as to become a kind of tribal, 
collective identity. This tribal, magical sense of selfhood remains transpersonal in nature as it is a sense of identity which is defined in terms of blood relations, kinship, heredity, and fluid metabolic processes. It is a sense of selfhood, in other words, which has come to be localized within the life body, or biotic physiological layer of our corporeal composition. Much as the identity of a raindrop is able to merge and blend as it falls into a lake or ocean, this physiological sense of identity is likewise necessarily fluid and interpersonal. The primary dimensionality of magical consciousness is that of unity. The tribe is unified through ritualistic practices which blend and interweave human beings into a kind of psychical superorganism. Likewise, magical spells and incantations are experienced as a means of deriving power through relations of sympathetic resonance or formative similarity. With this transition from archaic to magical awareness, the human sense of selfhood begins its journey upward, a process which continued as magical consciousness came to be enfolded within the subsequent mythical structure of human consciousness. Within mythical consciousness, we see the emergence of polarity as the most central dimensionality of human awareness. The central role of polar complementarity is something we have looked at in more detail in previous videos, but for our current purposes, what is most significant here is that this development corresponds to the first intimations of a transcendental, individual sense of selfhood which can be regarded as the polar complement of the interpersonal, tribal sense of selfhood which came to develop within magical awareness. The human sense of self again came to migrate upwards, from the realm of mana, or metabolic processes, into the realm of pneuma, prana, or anima, the animating breath of life. The human personality in the sense of behavioral patterns, actions, drives, fears, and impulses. Through this upward migration, we see the emergence of a sense of the individual human being as something which can be abstracted from the relations of blood, kinship, and nationality which define the magical sense of tribal selfhood. Here I want us to take a slight detour in order to properly contextualize this phase of development. By looking to the bicameral mentality theory, which was developed by the Yale psychologist Julian Jaynes. Within his 1976 work, The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, Jaynes argues that prior to the late Bronze Age, human beings did not yet experience their inner world of thought as something which emanated from an internal self or ego. By looking to literary artifacts from the ancient world, Jaynes attempts to demonstrate that human beings of the classical age did not experience their inner monologue as being their self. Rather, the ancients always regarded the voices within their minds as being the voices of the ancestors, or as the voices of the gods. Ancient poets and religious writers never speak as though they themselves are writing down thoughts which belong to their personal selves, but rather they indicate that their writings are the relaying of the words spoken to them by deities. There is scarcely any indication of thought understood as an action performed by human beings, but Rather, thought seems to be regarded as something which happens to human beings, which directs and compels them from the realm of the dead, as is the case with ancestral beings, or from a celestial, transcendental realm, as with gods, deva, or angels. 
What this all seems to imply then is that within the mythical structure of consciousness which characterized the classical age, the human sense of selfhood had yet to ascend from the ethological realm of prana or pneuma and into the psychical realm of thought forms or inner dialogues. In other words, the mythical structure of consciousness had yet to be enfolded within the mental structure of consciousness. Although it may seem very natural to we modern peoples to feel that we are our thoughts, or at the very least that our thoughts are produced by our own selfhood, this sense of self is in fact a rather recent development historically. It is not until the late Roman period when we begin to see the first intimations of this movement from ethological selfhood to psychical selfhood. Within Stoic metaphysics, we see the concept of pneuma reconceptualized in accordance with this transformation. The Stoics came to see pneuma as a mixture of the elements air and fire that is, the ethological and the psychical, rather than air alone. During the second century AD, Roman sculptors began carving holes into the eyes of statues and busts so as to represent pupils, whereas previously the features of the eyes were only painted onto the smooth surface of the stone eyes. Within this development of artistic practices, we can see an indication of the transformations which were unfolding within human consciousness during this time period, and in particular the movement of the physical sense of self-locality within the human body. Within the magical structure of consciousness, the self is felt to be within the belly or viscera understood as the core of the fluid, metabolic processes which the self is identified with within magical awareness. Within mythical consciousness, this center of self-gravity moves upward into the realm of the lungs, throat, mouth, or heart, the centers of pneumatic, vocal, or respiratory processes which correspond to the ethological, behavioral body. Within mental consciousness, this center of self-experience moves further upward, and comes to be felt as that which casts the light of consciousness onto the world through the eyes. We come to feel ourselves to be somewhere behind our eyes, in other words, and the holes drilled into the pupils of Roman sculptures indicate the sense that the eyes were coming to be seen as windows, through which the human self encountered the world beyond itself. As the triangular shape of our diagram indicates, each stage of this ascent of selfhood is also a contraction of self-awareness. The diffuse, boundless, world-self-identity of archaic consciousness constricted itself so as to form the magical, tribal self. Within mythical awareness, the sense of the individual human personality came to emerge from and complement this sense of tribal identity. Within mental consciousness, the mental body of the individual human being begins to be experienced as an interior and transcendental world unto itself, one which is separated by an individual horizon of consciousness from a world which has now come to be experienced as an external other. Just as the emergence of magical consciousness resulted in a division between the realm of the human and the realm of nature, the emergence of mental consciousness resulted in a similar division between the consciousness of the individual human mind and the world which was now felt to extend beyond its confines. The next phase in the development of human consciousness would begin approximately with the 15th century, during the Italian Renaissance. 
During this period, we begin to see the emergence of perspectival consciousness. Within the ever-present origin, Gebser himself does not regard perspectival consciousness as a distinct structure of consciousness in its own right, but rather regards it as a later development of the mental structure. Part of the reason for this may have been that while the other structures of consciousness developed in a relatively global manner, perspectival consciousness came to emerge specifically within the world of European civilization. In a sense, I think that Gebser is right to regard perspectival awareness as unique among the other structures of consciousness. It seems to be, in many ways, a kind of segue or turning point which began in a very localized manner, and which ultimately serves the purpose of laying the groundwork for the development of the subsequent, integral structure of consciousness which is currently ongoing. Nevertheless, it seems to me that the consciousness represented by figures such as Leonardo da Vinci or René Descartes is as different from the mental consciousness of Plato and Aristotle as Plato and Aristotle are different from the mythical awareness we see depicted in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Furthermore, if we look once again to our metaphysical scheme, it would appear that the emergence of perspectival consciousness would correspond to the movement of human self-awareness from the realm of the mental body into the realm of consciousness as such. In other words, we increasingly came to feel ourselves to be that which thinks our thoughts rather than feeling ourselves to simply be our thoughts. The psychical body of thought forms came to be experienced as a kind of shell which surrounded an inner core of pure self-awareness as such. The felt sense of self-locality likewise came to recede from the interior of the eyes and into the internal darkness of the human brain. Just as the skull separates the brain from the outside world, the shell of thought forms came to be experienced even more acutely as a kind of barrier, which demarcated the individual self from the world it was situated within. Once again, we can see that this upward motion represents a narrowing of self-identity, with human self-identity now coming to form a kind of atomic, point-like singularity situated within an endlessly expansive spatial grid. The atomic Cartesian ego, which the Cartesian coordinate space radiates outward from. In many ways, this point-like ego-self is isomorphic to the apex of the Platonic metaphysical pyramid. Within Platonic, Neoplatonic, Stoic, and Hermetic understandings of the cosmos, the material world is conceptualized as lying at the base of a great triangular hierarchy. At the apex of this hierarchy, we find the principle of the ultimate the form of the good, the monad, or simply God. The various layers of the cosmos are then seen to radiate downward from that central, fundamental apex. Within perspectival consciousness, this metaphysical pyramid comes to be essentially flipped over into a horizontal position. The apex of the metaphysical pyramid then comes to be occupied by the perspectival ego itself, rather than by an ultimate transcendental object. Just as the world was seen to radiate outward from the cosmic apex within Platonic metaphysics, we see in Renaissance art forms and Cartesian metaphysics that the world was now understood to be an infinite spatial field which extended outward from the point-like ego self. It is here that we find the point of greatest contraction in the journey of human self-awareness, but as our diagram indicates, this 
point-like singularity also serves as a bridge towards the expansion or dilation of self-awareness within subsequent phases of development. But before looking to the phases which will unfold in the aftermath of the perspectival self, we should first look to how this phylogenetic development is mirrored within the morphogenesis of individual human beings throughout the course of personal lifetimes. During the 19th century, the German biologist and philosopher Ernst Haeckel developed what came to be called recapitulation theory encapsulated in the phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Recapitulation theory suggests that within the ontogeny, or developmental morphogenesis, of a given organism, we are able to see a reenactment of the phylogenetic, or evolutionary, phases which gave rise to the organism. In other words, the embryonic or juvenile phases of an organism's development will recreate the earlier stages of that organism's evolutionary history. When we compare the development of an individual human being to the phylogenetic development of human consciousness throughout history, we seem to see parallels which are very similar. The ontogeny of the human self seems to recapitulate its phylogenetic evolution. As previously indicated, the embryonic gestation of the human being correlates with the archaic structure of consciousness within Gebser's model. The uterine state is one in which there is not yet any real sense of delineation between the physical body of the infant and the physical body of the mother. In other words, there is not yet any sense of self-world delineation. Following the physiological birth of the human infant, we then begin to see a process of development which not only mirrors the historical development of human consciousness, but which also corresponds very closely with the processions of the celestial realm, particularly the cycles of the planet Saturn. One full revolution of the planet Saturn encompasses a period of approximately 28 years, which we can then divide into four periods of seven years, which correspond to distinct phases of the human development process. The first seven years of a child's life, tracked by the first quarter of the Saturn cycle, correlates with the development of a sense of selfhood which is, like magical consciousness, fundamentally interpersonal and localized within the life body or metabolic body. The child feels itself to be its bodily needs of hunger and thirst, and moreover, feels itself to be continuous with the mother and the family unit. There is a sense of delineation between self and world, but the sense of selfhood remains liquid, and thus continuous with others through relations of blood. Within the period encompassing years 7 to 14, the child then begins to develop a sense of ethological selfhood. The child begins to develop greater mastery over its own behavior, and thus begins to experience itself as its behavioral personality. The child begins to feel itself to be its interests, impulses, inclinations, anxieties, and activity patterns. Within the period encompassing years 14 to 21, the child begins to develop a sense of selfhood which corresponds to the psychical body. It experiences itself as being its own thoughts, and it is during this period that many children begin to develop a sense of individual identity which is clearly demarcated from the family unit. Sexual and romantic inclinations begin to develop in conjunction with the increasing sense of self-world differentiation, and the child begins to develop a sense of concern for what beliefs, moral commitments, or aesthetic sensibilities define him. From years 21 to 28, then, 
We have the culmination of this development cycle as mental selfhood gives rise to perspectival selfhood. The human being comes to experience itself as a particular singularity of experience which lies nested within the material, physiological, ethological, and psychical bodies. Here we must also note the fact that this phase is a relatively recent development within the context of historical evolution. As we have seen, perspectival awareness first began to emerge within forms of art which developed during the 15th century. This sense of selfhood did not erupt all at once, but rather it was a mode of experience which originated among a very small number of professional artists. Individuals who were particularly attuned to the dynamics of the collective unconscious. Only much later did this perspectival awareness begin to unfold within the works of philosophers, and only gradually has this mode of self-awareness come to germinate within the consciousness of ordinary people. In fact, I would go so far as to say that even in our present historical era, Perspectival awareness is limited to a relatively minute percentage of the overall human population, though that percentage is rapidly growing with each generation. Until very recently, it seems that the vast majority of human beings did not actually progress through the developments which characterize the final quarter of the Saturn return cycle. The vast majority of people who lived ordinary lives in the 19th and 20th centuries never came to develop perspectival self-awareness, as their spiritual morphogenesis came to be more or less completed by the third quarter of the Saturn cycle. By about 21 years old, such individuals had come to mostly solidify as what they would be for the rest of their lives. For those who do continue their development towards the completion of the Saturn cycle, the Saturn return period itself is often a period of immensely challenging tumultuousness, emotional distress, paranoia, and anxiety. As the individual's self-awareness comes to further contract, this results in an ever more acute sense of self-atomization and alienation from the world and from others. Individuation implies separation, and such separation carries with it an immense amplification of anxiety as well as of experiential intensity. Many of you have probably heard of the 27 Club, a disturbingly long list of often very exceptional and creative people who lost their lives at age 27, the beginnings of the Saturn return period. This list includes figures such as Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, Amy Winehouse. The 27 Club is a list which is populated by artists, many of whom succumb to substance abuse related deaths. Artists tend to be individuals who lead very tumultuous and storied lives, and they tend to be individuals who are highly sensitive to the forces of collective consciousness which act through them. These are individuals whose existential intensity was already much greater than that of ordinary people, and individuals who were much more likely to undergo a metamorphosis of consciousness which most are never required to endure. The intensification of the Saturn return period, combined with other factors such as the alienation generated by celebrity status, has tended to drive such individuals towards substance abuse as a means of numbing themselves to the anxiety and torment of this process. Many such individuals do manage to make it out the other side of this transformation, but tragically, many do not. It is very appropriate that these developmental phases would correspond to the processions of the planet Saturn. Saturn is of course Kronos, the god of time, but here we must understand that time is itself a multidimensional process. 
Time is the actualization of potentialities. Time is duration, but in this Saturnian sense, time is inertia. It is the momentum through which the past comes to recreate itself through repetition, through cyclical reenactments. The Saturn is associated with conservatism, traditions, institutional power structures, and mountainous hierarchies. Within the context of the human individuation process, however, this Saturnian archetype acts to recreate within an individual human life the developmental structures which have been created through historical transformation. Saturnian ontological inertia is the modality of being through which the phylogenetic evolution of human consciousness comes to be realized within the life processes of the individual human being. This implies that the developmental phases undergone through the Saturn cycle are inheritances from the past that which has already become established through collective, historical developments. Following the Saturn return period, another developmental phase may then come to realize itself within an individual human consciousness, a structure of consciousness which, within our present historical era, we are creating much more so than we are inheriting from the past. This architecture which we are currently realizing is the integral structure of human consciousness, or rather what we can now infer to be the first of four distinct integral phases of human consciousness. In order to understand the situation which has now come to face us, the emergence of the integral self we should now look to the manner by which these distinct modalities and dimensionalities of consciousness come to give rise to one another. Here we must consider the distinction which Gebser makes between efficient and deficient modes of consciousness structures. Each structure of consciousness begins its existence in an efficient mode, within which the structure is able to effectively incorporate the structures of consciousness which have become enfolded within it. Magical awareness is one of unity through sympathetic resonance. Its primary dimensionality is the unification of difference. Within the efficient mode of magical consciousness, this unifying resonance incorporates the self-world identity of the archaic structure, such that the interweaving of human awareness with the natural world is experienced as a kind of reharmonization of a oneness which has come to be divided. Within the deficient mode of the magical, human awareness comes to be dissociated from the oneness of the archaic structure. As the interpenetrative resonance of magical awareness can no longer be experienced as a reunification of primordial oneness, this resonant interweaving is experienced as an immense paranoia and anxiety. The natural world comes to be experienced as a chaotic and dangerous abyss of chthonic, vital forces which threaten to resubsume human beings rather than as a nurturing and life-bestowing mother goddess. This deficiency of the magical structure thus facilitates the emergence of the mythical structure. As the resonant unity of the magical fissions apart to become mythical polarity, the complementary opposites of celestial and abyssal, light and darkness, yang and yin, sky and earth, masculine and feminine, sun and moon. Within the efficient mythical, magical unity and archaic oneness are incorporated such that polar opposites can be seen to form a unified whole. Polar complements can be seen as two sides of the same coin, and all polarities can be seen to emanate from a singular ultimate oneness. 
Gebser tells us that just as the point represents the unity of the magical structure, the circle or mandala represents the unity of polarities, which characterizes the mythical structure. The two complementary poles loop around into one another, thus forming the mythical cyclicity. As the mythical structure becomes deficient, losing contact with the unifying nature of its magical foundations, polar dyads come to be experienced as unstable relations of dominance and subordination. Light is seen to dominate darkness, order to dominate chaos, transcendence to dominate imminence, and so forth. Within this dialectical asymmetry, mythical polarity comes to mutate to become negation or contradiction, the primary feature of the mental structure. The possibility of contradiction becomes the principle of non-contradiction, which thereby forms the core of logical reasoning, as the mythical mandala becomes the triad or pyramid a feature which we can see very clearly in geometry, but also in the triadic nature of the logical syllogism, two premises and a conclusion forming a deductive trinity. Whether in its efficient or deficient mode, mental reasoning necessarily floats on top of a mythical ocean. The polarities of the mythical come to express themselves within the dynamics of mental thought. Within the works of thinkers such as Hegel and Jacques Derrida, we see an exploration of these mythical, dialectical dynamics which lie obfuscated beneath the surface of mental consciousness. The dualistic, negational nature of the mental structure is one of this or that yes or no, true or false. Insofar as the mental structure remains efficient, the previous structures of consciousness allow the mental to maintain its grasp of the ambiguous and the paradoxical, a grasp which is necessary in order for the mental structure to maintain its contact with the transcendental world of forms, gods, souls, and the eternal. Within this efficient mode of the mental, the world comes to be understood as a kind of pyramidal cosmic hierarchy, with the material world understood as the lowest layer of ontological strata which radiate outward from a central apex of ultimate perfection and unity, the Neoplatonic One or Monad. Yet as the mental structure becomes deficient and thereby loses contact with its archaic, magical, and mythical foundations, the ontological ambiguity and invisibility of the transcendental realm comes to be seen as suspect and unacceptable. We see such deficiency of the mental structure first emerged during the 11th century AD with the scholastic debates between metaphysical realism and anti-realist nominalism. While metaphysical realists maintained the reality of forms which characterized the Platonic, Neoplatonic, and Christian theological traditions, Nominalists instead argued that forms as such do not exist. Rather, nominalists argued that universal terms such as triangular or red were only meaningful insofar as they referred to collections of particular entities within the world. The nominalists, having lost contact with pre-mental structures of consciousness, saw the ontology of forms as incomprehensible, as the forms themselves cannot be directly apprehended through the same sensory perceptions which can confirm the presence or absence of particular entities within the corporeal realm the mental insistence upon non-contradiction led these scholastic thinkers to reject the hyperdimensionality of forms as a kind of philosophical illusion. As this deficiency of the mental structure came to intensify, the Platonic 
pyramidal hierarchy could no longer be experienced as emanating from a purely transcendental realm beyond the physical, as the very notion of non-corporeal, transcendental reality came to be an increasingly alien and nonsensical structure of thought and awareness. Rather than merely disintegrating, however, this platonic pyramid came to essentially flip itself into a horizontal position, thus giving rise to the perspectivism of Renaissance art, the point-like ego self, and the Cartesian coordinate space. Within classical Hellenic philosophy, the hypochimenon, the ground or foundation of all being, was described as an ultimate, eternal, and transcendental object which stood in opposition to the natural world of temporal, corporeal particulars. As Martin Heidegger shows us in his analysis of Cartesian metaphysics, the role of the hypochimenon would come to be occupied by the perspectival ego-self rather than by the monad or god. Just as the world was seen to radiate downward from this ultimate transcendental within the efficient mental structure, the world within perspectival consciousness came to be experienced as a grid of infinitely expansive space which radiated outward from the point-like ego singularity. Efficient perspectival awareness can be seen exemplified by figures such as Leonardo da Vinci, René Descartes, or Isaac Newton. Figures who utilized perspectival awareness as a means of seeing more clearly and deeply into the nature of corporeal actuality while nevertheless maintaining the connection between perspectival awareness and the pre-perspectival structures of consciousness which grounded it. Isaac Newton was as much an alchemist as he was a physicist, and René Descartes kept journals of his various mystical dream experiences. These were not thinkers who saw a world as merely a grid occupied by BBs of inert, lifeless matter, as mental, mythical, magical, and archaic consciousness remained active within their experience of the world, even if this activity was much more overshadowed than had been the case in previous epochs. Just as the magical structure can be encapsulated within the symbol of the point, mythical within the circle, and mental within the triad, perspectival consciousness can be best encapsulated, as I see it, by the quadrant, representing the edges of the Platonic metaphysical pyramid, which has been rendered horizontally so as to place the human ego within the role of the foundational hypochimenon. In order to understand the deficiency of perspectival consciousness and how such deficiency has come to necessitate the emergence of the subsequent integral structure, we must now look to a figure who is perhaps the single most consequential thinker in all of the modern age, Immanuel Kant. Kant was famously awoken from his dogmatic slumber by the works of David Hume, whose skepticism brought about a kind of metaphysical crisis within Kant's own thinking. Hume's philosophy was fundamentally empiricist in nature, following in the tradition of thinkers like John Locke and thus presuming that the contents of the human mind were derived through sensory experiences, and that any rational inferences made about the natural world must be empirical in nature. Hume demarcated between two forms of knowledge, a division which is often referred to as Hume's fork. According to Hume, there are matters of fact pertaining to the natural world and relations of ideas, logical deductions made on the basis of formal definitions. Within this Humean scheme of thought, a very serious problem came to arise. How can the human intellect make inferences about the natural world which extend beyond the bounds of that which is empirically experienced? 
as we can see with the phrase relations of ideas, Hume's epistemology carries an implicit suggestion of philosophical nominalism, that knowledge of universals is detached or untethered from the natural world which the perspectival ego empirically encounters without any recourse to knowledge of a formative realm which transcends the particularities of the natural, empirical world, Hume saw no means of rationally justifying any of the general claims made about the world by natural science. We might observe empirically that the sun has risen every day up until today, so Hume tells us, but we have no way to rationally justify the claim that the sun will always rise every morning. We can claim that the sun behaves in accordance with physical laws, but human consciousness cannot empirically observe a law. It can only observe regularities and then generalize so as to postulate such a law. Without the metaphysical realism needed to cognize the formative dimension of our reality, Hume simply concluded that such generalizations were in fact irrational and ultimately no more than the result of custom or habit. Kant, quite understandably, found such a conclusion to be utterly unacceptable, as relegating such inductive inferences about nature to mere irrational habit negated the universality of scientific rationality itself. If any and all general claims about the nature of the world amounted only to habitual inferences, then such claims could not be supported or defended through the use of rational argument, but rather only by appeal to one's particular and contingent cultural frame of reference. In his effort to resolve this unacceptable dilemma posed by Hume's reasoning, Kant came to unfold Hume's fork into a fourfold quadrant. Rather than merely demarcating between empirical matters of fact and a priori relations of ideas, Kant organized forms of possible knowledge along two axes one pertaining to how knowledge is justified, and the other pertaining to what the knowledge is about. Within Kant's scheme, the justification axis is divided between the a priori, knowledge derived formally from reason itself, and the a posteriori, knowledge derived from empirical experiences of the world. The aboutness or object axis is then divided into the synthetic knowledge which is about the natural world and the analytic knowledge which is about ideas. With these two axes, we can then see the emergence of a quadrant system consisting of the synthetic a posteriori, the analytic a posteriori, the analytic a priori, and the synthetic a priori. For the synthetic a posteriori and the analytic a priori, there is nothing really new here. These two terms really just amount to Hume's distinction between matters of fact and relations of ideas, the former consisting of facts about the world which are derived from our experience of the world, and the latter consisting of knowledge about ideas which are derived from logical reasoning. The notion of the analytic a posteriori suggests the possibility of knowledge which is about ideas or concepts, but which is derived from empirical experiences. Within Kant's critique of pure reason, he dismisses the analytic a posteriori as impossible, almost as a flippant technicality which is barely worthy of consideration. As we shall soon see, this overlooking of the analytic a posteriori by Kant will prove to be immensely significant, and perhaps equally ironic. The analytic a posteriori represents the doorway through which Kant could have made his way out of the prison that he was wandering deeper into, and yet he marched right past it with barely a second thought. Kant dismissed the analytic a posteriori so readily because his true aim was the synthetic a priori. 
the possibility of knowledge about the sensory world which could be derived from reason itself rather than through empirical observations of the world. In order to surmount the impasse which Hume's skepticism had brought him upon, Kant asks the question, how can the synthetic a priori be possible? How can we know things about the world which are not derived from our experience of the world? Kant answers this question by suggesting that we might be able to have a priori knowledge about the world we experience if and only if we are able to use reason to make universal claims, not about the world in itself, but rather about the manner by which the human mind necessarily structures our experience of the world. Within this claim, we can see the intimation of Kant's distinction between the world as it is in itself and the world as it is experienced by human beings, the distinction between the noumenon and phenomenon. If the human mind necessarily structures our experiences of the world through certain categorical schemes such as causation, temporal sequence, and spatiality, then we can make universally valid claims about the phenomenal world, the world as it is revealed within the horizons of human consciousness. It would then appear that Hume's skepticism has been surmounted. We can know things about the world before we experience it because we can know a priori how the human mind necessarily presents the world to us. But in making this epistemological play as a means of wiggling out from underneath Hume's shadow, Kant unknowingly came to give full articulation to what we can now see as the deficient mode of the perspectival consciousness structure. Kant's metaphysical scheme came to fully and definitively rupture the world of perspectival human awareness from the world itself. If the phenomenal realm is understood to be that which is, by definition, structured and rendered by the human mind, and the world in itself is understood to be that which is, by definition, not experienced by the human mind, then it must necessarily be concluded that human awareness never encounters the world. We cannot know what the world is actually like because we only ever encounter the world as phenomena. We only experience the world as it is depicted by the mind. The quadratic grid space of the perspectival consciousness structure came to form a kind of cage, which would definitively divide human consciousness from the world it found itself within. Kant himself remained very confident that this play would allow him to hold on to the universality which Hume's empiricist skepticism dissolved. But such universality can only be maintained within such a framework insofar as the human mind structures the human phenomenal realm in consistent necessary and universal ways. As soon as one begins to surmise that different modes of human consciousness, or even distinct individual human beings, might experience the world in different ways, then this universality itself comes to disintegrate, and we are left with a completely dissolutive anti-realist perspectivism which completely lacks any such universal ground Ending. Within such absolute relativism, we can begin to see one of the two possible avenues which the development of human consciousness would be faced with as a way beyond Kant's phenomenological prison of deficient perspectival awareness. This first route essentially amounts to what is commonly referred to as postmodernism or poststructuralism. A mode of awareness which here I think we can understand as being the deficient mode of the integral consciousness structure. 
Within postmodern awareness, the perspectival ego self comes to recede inward even further, abandoning the Kantian aspirations of phenomenological universality, which were the last threads tethering it to the possibilities of objectivity, truth, and a stable connection to the world itself. Each ego perspective experiences its own phenomenological horizon as fundamentally contingent, unprivileged, and unbounded by any forms of transcendental necessity or universality. All claims to truth and objectivity, all teleological narratives, all myths and aesthetic forms, all moral principles and expectations come to be seen as mere projections which radiate outward from the ego self, or which are imposed upon the ego self by other human beings. As we saw in one of our recent videos, this dissolutive anti-realism can be seen most thoroughly encapsulated in the life, works, and eventual mental breakdown of Friedrich Nietzsche. The ego comes to be completely untethered from any sense of solid grounding, and all things come to be seen as mere projections mere confabulations, which issue forth from the ego's own characteristic will to self-securing power. Just as Nietzsche's life most succinctly captures this motion, by which the postmodern ego self collapses into itself like a star forming a black hole, the cultural phenomenon of postmodernism demonstrates this exact same process in slow motion. Postmodern art forms came to cynically parody and ridicule the very possibilities of beauty, truth, and ultimacy. Art came to be a parody of art, and postmodern philosophy likewise came to be a parody of philosophy, which was often explicitly driven by the exact same cynical will to dominate and destroy which postmodern awareness came to see as the fundamental driving force of reality itself. But if we now back up a bit historically and look to the German philosophers who immediately succeeded Kant, we can see that the first flowerings of the efficient integral structure almost immediately sprung forth from the deficient perspectival consciousness which Kant himself had consummated. If we see the lineage beginning with Descartes and culminating in Kant as a metaphysical dissociation of the human mind from the world, then we can see post-Kantian German philosophy as an attempt to reassociate the human with nature through elaborating the implications of Kant's own metaphysics in even more radical ways. Friedrich Schelling, for example, took Kant's central inquiry, what must the human mind necessarily be like in order for our experience of the world to be as it is, and inverted it, so as to ask, what must the world necessarily be like in order for human consciousness to be what it is? Pursuing this question would lead Schelling to develop a philosophy of nature which would mend the Kantian rupture between human and world, rather than conceptualizing human consciousness as a kind of impenetrable screen which reflected an unknowable and alien world, Schelling saw the experiential nature of human existence as continuous with a fundamental animacy which characterized reality itself. Perhaps the most poignant example of this transformation, however, can be seen in an exchange between the philosophers Johann von Goethe and Friedrich Schiller. Goethe and Schiller met for the first time during a conference of the Society for Nature Research in Jena. Following this conference, the two philosophers proceeded with a very extensive conversation about the nature of biological life, which eventually made its way to Schiller's residence. 
Goethe was attempting to explain to Schiller what he would come to call the Orpflanz, or archetypal plant. And Goethe used a pen and paper to illustrate for Schiller this inner form which he believed he was able to see within different types of plant life. Upon seeing this illustration, Schiller remarked that this image was, quote, just an idea. To which Goethe replied, then I saw an idea. Recall again how Kant almost flippantly dismissed the possibility of the analytic a posteriori, the possibility of deriving knowledge about ideas, concepts, or rather forms, through empirical experience of the natural world. What Goethe illustrated for Schiller on pen and paper that night seems to have been precisely that, an apprehension of the formative, archetypal composition of nature which Goethe directly experienced through his study of nature rather than knowledge which he derived through abstract logical reasoning. With both Goethe and Schelling, as well as Hegel and later German philosophers such as Heidegger and Rudolf Steiner, we see that the deficient perspectival comes to be resolved into a novel modality of human consciousness. Perspectival consciousness allows for the possibility of seeing the multidimensionality of nature we can now begin to see that the manifestations of the world within our consciousness give us only a particular slice, as it were, of a much more multivalent reality. Different perspectives bring the world to presence in different ways, of course, but within the integral awareness of German idealism, thinkers like Goethe and Schelling began to see through the particular perspectival manifestations of the world and into the diaphanous, hyperdimensional, formative structures of possibility which give rise to such concrete perspectival manifestations. This awareness of perspectival contingency, rather than collapsing into itself in the kind of nihilistic death spiral which we see in postmodernism, instead came to render the manifest world transparent. Through this transparency, human consciousness was beginning to directly experience the formative composition of reality, the structures of possibility, phase spaces, or auras, which are invisible to our physical senses, but which can be apprehended by the mind. In one sense, this noetic or spiritual perception is something which human consciousness has always been capable of, but only ever unconsciously. If we look back to Platonic, Neoplatonic, or medieval Christian philosophy, we see an orientation towards the transcendental, formal realm. But it was always asserted that our contact with such a formative domain was achieved through the pure, abstract activity of the intellect alone. The Neoplatonists, for example, did not believe that they could encounter the transcendental or the divine through the study of nature or through empirical experiences of the world. The natural world was understood to be a kind of shadow or projection of the transcendental realm, and therefore genuine understanding was achieved through using one's mind to transcend mere perception and ascend to higher forms of knowledge. Yet, within the world of perspectival consciousness, which emerged during the Italian Renaissance, this attitude came to dramatically change. As we see in the perspectivity of Renaissance art and in the experimental adventurousness of alchemical proto-science, human beings began to engage with the natural world under the presumption that truth could be achieved through direct, imminent engagement between the human mind and the world. 
this naturalistic enterprise and the perspectival mode of awareness which emerged with it developed specifically in Christian Europe because such transformations could have only been possible within a metaphysical life world which had already been transformed by Christianity. Though here it is significant that we understand Christianity as being most fundamentally a teleological impulse within collective consciousness rather than simply an institutional structure, creed, or corpus of beliefs. It has often been said that modern science came to emerge within Christian Europe due to the fact that Christian monotheism implicated a universe with a stable, universal, and comprehensible order. Frankly, I think this explanation is absolute nonsense. This explanation does not work because every single metaphysical schema throughout every single human culture throughout history has indicated a world which is organized in accordance with a stable, universal, and comprehensible order. Christian monotheism has no monopoly whatsoever on the notion that the world is structured and guided by a universal, harmonious order. What is unique to Christianity, however, is an emphasis on the direct, interior, personal experience of individual human beings. Within the idea of theosis, we have the implication that the driving will of the cosmos as a whole, the divine logos, might be able to germinate within the individual human being and thereby transform the individual human being in accordance with such an ultimate divine will. As we see in Gnosticism as well as in alchemical proto-science, this imperative drive unto theosis brought with it the expectation that the individual human being might achieve such salvific enlightenment through direct experience, which could facilitate a contact between human consciousness and the Logos itself. Within the alchemical tradition, which would eventually become science, this is exactly what we see. Medieval and Renaissance alchemists were not simply attempting to ascertain contingent and meaningless factual knowledge about the natural world in an effort to control and manipulate the world. Their quest was explicitly a quest towards spiritual enlightenment, towards the salvation of theosis through gnosis. It would thus appear to be the case that the inner imperative of Christianity is what facilitated the development of perspectival awareness from deficient mental awareness within European civilization but not within, for example, Chinese or Indian civilization. In most spiritual traditions, spiritual knowledge is attained through the absorption of traditional spiritual wisdom by the individual. The tradition itself is always assumed to be wiser than the individual. The truth is what the tradition teaches, not what the individual concludes through their own exploration of the world. This epistemological emphasis on tradition mirrors the equivocation of social expectations and moral rightness which we see in most non-Western civilizations. Outside of the Western tradition, and Christianity more specifically, the human individual is much more often regarded as a problem to be solved through the dissolution of the individual self into a collective, while Western thought has always regarded the individual personality as that which contains within it the power to achieve greatness, utopia, salvation, or gnosis. In the Apology of Socrates, we see an archetypal dramatization of this conflict between the individualistic solar impulse which animates the Western spirit and the collectivistic nature of social conformity. 
Socrates was accused by the Athenians of eroding the people's faith in the gods and thereby compromising the dogmatism which facilitated Athenian social cohesion. Socrates was quite rightly seen as a threat to the prevailing social order, as his philosophy suggested that individual human beings could use reason itself to arrive at truth directly without mediation by institutional doctrines or traditions. However, the implication that such gnosis could be achieved through experience, rather than by abstract reasoning alone, would not begin to develop until many centuries later, following the advent of the Christian impulse within Western consciousness, the impulse which would eventually necessitate the emergence of perspectival consciousness from the deficiencies of the mental consciousness structure, and consequently give rise to modern science, perspectival art, liberalist individualism, and modernist philosophy. Rudolf Steiner once said that the human being is turned inside out. This might seem to be a rather cryptic and unusual statement, but if we properly understand the evolution of human consciousness which we have sketched out thus far, we can begin to see just how profoundly insightful this statement truly is. As the human sense of selfhood has moved upward through the various strata of our ontological composition, moving into ever more transcendental domains of consciousness, so too has this sense of selfhood been moving inward, into layers of our existence which are ever more foundational and closer to the core of our being. As the human sense of self comes to move into the first phase of the integral structure, our consciousness comes to incorporate an awareness of the spiritual domain into the manifold of self-awareness and self-causal agency. As we saw with Julian Jaynes and his bicameral mentality theory, the movement of the sense of selfhood from the ethological body into the mental body gave rise to a novel mode of human self-awareness. Prior to this transformation during the Late Bronze Age, the human mental body was experienced not as part of the self, but rather as the literal voices of the gods or ancestors. Similarly, as our consciousness transitions from the perspectival ego into the luminous dimension of the psychical realm, the thought aura, we come to experience our intuitional awareness of the transcorporeal as something which is a part of our sense of selfhood. Such intuitional awareness comes to be felt as something which we actively do, and something which we feel to be happening within our sense of selfhood, rather than as something which is happening beneath the surface of our conscious awareness. It is only through this transition that Johann von Goethe was able to consciously perceive the archetypal potentiality structure which lay within different forms of plant life. The archetypal plant, or Urpflans, which Goethe perceived was not a corporeal body, but rather a phase space of possibility which facilitated the generation of the corporeal bodies which he observed with his sensorial faculties. We see a similar movement in the works of Hegel. Hegel's philosophy is often characterized as a system of metaphysical idealism. Hegel sought to apprehend the dynamics by which the formative realm of patterns, possibilities, and archetypes is able to give shape to the evolutionary processions of history. 
In many ways, Hegel's philosophy reiterates the idealistic nature of the Platonic metaphysical tradition which he was situated within, but unlike classical Platonists, Hegel perceived the formative dynamics of the world through their activity in shaping history, rather than simply through the activity of abstract intellectual reasoning. Much like Goethe and Schelling, Hegel was driven by the will to perceive the formative powers which lay within the manifest. As Hegel's philosophical works illustrate, one of the most central features of the integral structure is a transformation of the manner by which time is experienced and conceptualized. Within both mythical and mental consciousness, the relationship between time and eternality is understood as a distinction between imperfection and perfection. Within classical philosophy, change is understood to be a result of imperfection. If something were perfect, then it would have no need to move or transform. The eternal realm, therefore, was understood as a domain of perfect, transcendental objects which, due to their perfection, existed outside of both time and space. The transcendental world was characterized as that which lay an infinite distance beyond the corporeal sensory realm, and the corporeal was therefore seen to be a kind of imperfect shadow of the transcendental eternal domain. The activity of the transcendental realm was understood as necessity and as fate. The transcendental was seen to be that which dictates the corporeal realm. Often this understanding facilitated an understanding of time as degeneration, the conception that time itself was a kind of steady decay through which the perfect and eternal came to gradually give way to ever more imperfection in repeating cycles of entropic self-annihilation. Within perspectival consciousness, time comes to be spatialized and thus relativized into a kind of phenomenological projection. We see the first thorough manifestation of this spatial relativization in Kant, who regarded time as a necessary structural feature of human consciousness rather than as a feature of the world itself. This spatial denaturing of time can also be seen in the implicit metaphysics of Albert Einstein, whose mathematical depiction of the world quite literally rendered time as a fourth spatial dimension, such that the distinction between past and future was no longer comprehensible outside of a particular perspectival reference frame. Within integral awareness, however, time comes to be experienced in a very different manner, not as degeneration, but rather as what Gebser refers to as concretion, or what Whitehead refers to as concrescence. Time comes to be understood as a process by which distributed, indeterminate auras of potentiality come to concretize or collapse so as to achieve the determination which is characteristic of corporeal reality. In coming to conceptualize time in such a manner, time can come to be understood as an ever-ongoing process of creative, constructive evolution rather than simply a process of decay or a phenomenological illusion. Human consciousness then comes to truly experience its own intrinsic self-determinacy its own creative freedom for the first time. Human awareness comes to experience the pre-corporeal dimension of its own psychical makeup as part of its own self-constitution, and we likewise experience our apprehension of the pre-corporeal as part of our own selfhood. 
Thus, we come to experience ourselves as being the psychical phase space, which collapses itself into determinate actualities of thought. We begin to experience a sense of voluntary agency, not only over our own explicit thoughts, but also in how our consciousness renders the world unto manifest experiences. In other words, we begin to feel a sense of agency in how we experience the world, a sense of freedom in how we choose to define our perceptions of a world which is fundamentally indeterminate and hyperdimensional. Coming to an awareness of the luminous, spiritual composition of reality necessarily implies a coming to awareness of its indeterminacy. As we have seen throughout Whitehead's process metaphysics, it is the indeterminacy within feelings of possibility, conceptual or luminous feelings, which then generate the determinacy of corporeal actuality. We must therefore come to an awareness of the darkness or formlessness within the luminous, the intrinsic indeterminacy within that which determines, the indefiniteness of that which achieves concrete definition. Everything you have ever seen with your eyes has been light. More specifically, everything you have ever seen has been the abstracting of form by the activity of light. Yet light in itself is invisible. A beam of light suspended in empty space would appear to us as nothing more than darkness. The light would need to reflect off of some corporeal body in order to come to participate in our consciousness through the illumination of something other than itself. Light, that which illuminates, is in itself the activity of darkness, that is, formless indeterminacy. Just as the stars can only be seen within the darkness of the night, the self-luminous dimension of our reality can only be perceived through an awareness of the abyssal, indefinite, and multivalent. John Gebser himself saw the significance of darkness and formlessness within the emergence of integral awareness, and we see this emphasis in his indication that a prefiguring of the integral can be seen in the thought of the 13th century German mystic Meister Eckhart. In his mystical writings, Eckhart focused upon what he referred to as the ungrund or abground, the dark, formless, groundless ground of existence itself. This Abground was understood by Eckhart to be, in a sense, pure nothingness, and yet in another sense, this abyss was understood to be the very ground of existence itself, the ultimate primordial condition for the very possibility of anything at all. In Eckhart's mysticism, we can see a kind of reaching inward, a striving of human consciousness to plunge into the fathomless depths which lie within, beneath, and beyond the confines of individual selfhood, and into the realm of transpersonal, ultimate oneness. The ever-present origin. This plunging inward of human self-awareness can also be seen in another medieval mystic who was a contemporary of Meister Eckhart, Angela of Foligno. Eckhart's writings in many ways maintained the characteristics of Neoplatonic rationalism. However much his thought may have pushed the bounds of such rationalism to their most extreme breaking points. With the works of Angela of Foligno, however, we see this inward movement take on a significantly more personal, experiential, and post-rational quality. 
Angela's experiences were ecstatic in the most extreme and almost horrifying sense. The accounts of her experiences seemed to show her on the very cusp of quite literal madness, and depict an individual who is driven much more so by a kind of unwavering compulsion than a cerebral quest of philosophical inquiry. Yet much like in Eckhart's works, Angela repeatedly expresses an obsessive fixation upon what she understood as a divine darkness, an ultimate power which was simultaneously boundless love as well as a titanic, all-annihilating abyss. For Angela of Foligno, this annihilating darkness was absolutely necessary as that which could immolate the human self so as to allow for the regeneration of human consciousness in accordance with the spirit of Christ, the cosmic logo. Some five centuries after Meister Eckhart and Angela of Foligno, Friedrich Schelling, Georg Hegel, and later still Martin Heidegger would incorporate and elaborate these conceptions of divine darkness within the first thorough metaphysical articulations of integral consciousness. By reaching into and through such metaphysical darkness, these thinkers would come to see the formative, spiritual dimensions of reality, not as an unmoving, transcendental realm which lay ever beyond the natural world, but rather as that which resides within the corporeal, beneath the surface of that which is present and manifest in relation to a given perspectival moment of sensory experience. These first seeds of truly integral consciousness came to germinate during the late 18th century, among a very elect class of highly educated and hyper-intellectual individuals. Within our present phase of history, now at what appears to be the grand climax of modernity, this integral awareness seems to be expanding and beginning to develop as a widespread phenomenon throughout global civilization, rather than being a mode of consciousness reserved for an intellectual elite. The analytic philosopher of mind, Daniel Dennett, who I tend to disagree with about almost everything, once said that, quote, If you make yourself small enough, you can externalize virtually anything, end quote. Dennett was speaking of the notion of free will and how we tend to shrink ourselves when thinking about our voluntary agency. If, for example, I begin to think of the neurons in my own skull as purely mechanical processes which are not me, but which push me around, as it were, then I can begin to feel that those neurons are an external other, which pulls upon the marionette strings which determine my behavior. If I think of my cultural upbringing as something which is separate from myself, then likewise I can come to think of my cultural conditioning as something outside of myself, which myself has no control over. As we look at things in this way, we come to shrink into a kind of ineffectual, powerless observer which merely watches our bodies and minds go through certain motions without the consent of that atomistic, point-like self. Looking back at the territory we have surveyed in this video, we can understand this contraction of the self into an alienated singularity as a manifestation of the deficient perspectival consciousness exemplified by Kant. 
But if we broaden our scope, we can see that this contraction of the human sense of selfhood is in fact only one particular phase of a much larger process of historical evolution by which human selfhood has actually been striving towards ever greater dilation. As the human self has continued to migrate upward through the various strata of our ontological composition, our sense of self has continued to become ever more encompassing. As this process has continued, and as it proceeds into the future, this growth will continue, and so too will the human sense of freedom, as we come to incorporate ever more of our own being into our sense of self-awareness. Within integral consciousness, the subjectivistic prison formed by the deficient perspectival quadrant mutates so as to form a hyperdimensional object, one which Gebser suggests we could visualize as a sphere, but which I personally think is better understood as a torus. The point-like nature of perspectival awareness becomes the field-like nature of integral awareness. Within such field-like consciousness, awareness of particular actualities comes to be contextualized within a broader awareness of the potentialities which generate such actualities. The world begins to become transparent to the human spirit. The world becomes diaphanous. All of this certainly leaves a few important questions conspicuously hanging. If the picture I've sketched out in this video actually does reflect the general architecture of consciousness evolution, then that implies that the integral awareness which is currently coming to unfold is only the first of four distinct phases of integral consciousness. So then, what will the next three phases of our evolution actually look like? Of course, that is a question that I can only address in a very tentative and speculative way, and so for now at least I'll state my thoughts on that very briefly. In a sense, the integral structure, the perspectival structure, and the mental structure have all been modes of psychical self-awareness. They have developed the human sense of selfhood within the realm of thought form. As we move further into the subsequent phases of integral awareness, we will come to move even deeper into the depths of our being. Ever more layers of our reality will come to reveal themselves as the corporeal world comes to be ever more transparent to human consciousness. The forces which act to shape our behaviors, our biological bodies, and even the material, molecular composition of our existence will increasingly come to be enfolded within the human sense of selfhood and thus the human sense of voluntary agency. Imagining what exactly that might come to look like, let alone feel like, is probably extending this discussion far beyond what I can yet clearly envision and certainly far beyond what I can speak of with any certainty. Nonetheless, the capacities which we have come to develop thus far seem to afford us a capacity to see much further along the path before us than perhaps any before us have been able to do, at least not through the use of voluntary intellectual thought. In a sense, projecting our thoughts through time and space in this way is very much like dreaming. But unlike the mythical and mystical experiences of those who dreamed within previous epochs of the human journey, this is a dreaming that we can do actively and purposefully. A dreaming which we achieve through waking up rather than by drifting into sleep. 
The good news is that our consciousness contains powers beyond our wildest imagination and that the true depth of those powers is beginning to reveal itself. The bad news is that we are waking up within a titanic edifice which has been built up around us as we slept. We now begin to find ourselves coming to an awareness of where we really are, within the belly of the labyrinth. As always, thanks for watching.